Hey everyone, uh, my name is Lewis Nelson. I'm a professor here at the University of Virginia. I got my start here at the University, of, uh, sorry, the School of Architecture in 2001, where I was hired as the early American architectural historian. I have um, now taken on the mantle of vice provost for academic outreach, and so I'm particularly interested in uh, the ways that the university engages with communities and the ways that we uh, share the message of who we are with communities and in partnership with communities and the ways that we're really pursuing our identity as a public university. And so many, many of those sort of really higher level questions about our identity uh, and also about our systems and structures um, are things that I'm kind of stirring the pot on all the time, which is totally a lot of fun. Uh, so what I have for you today, however, has nothing to do with my official academic administrative role, but really some of the research work that I've been doing over the last few years in partnership with many other colleagues so the lecture that I'm going to give, and it's, um, I, I have a big stack of notes here, but I'm not really going to use those, um, except for one section. Uh, the lecture I'm going to give is taken from a book project that will be published in summer of 2019, uh, August. And we're actually looking at August 12th as the publication date, uh, 2019, for the publication of a, the definitive uh, volume on slavery at the University of Virginia. It's a 10-chapter project. It includes six different authors. Uh, Maury McGinnis, uh, who's now at the University of Texas as their provost, and I are the co-editors of this volume. And it looks specifically at how does, um, how is the University of Virginia's early history up through the, the um, Civil War and a little bit after inextricably linked uh, with the institution of slavery and fundamental racial injustices that are part of this place. Um, so with that, you're going to need to be able to see the screen. And so let me give you a, an opportunity. If you can't see the screen, um, to sort of move forward um, if that's something you feel like you, you want to be able to do because you're, you're definitely going to want to be able to see the screen for our time together. So when I was asked to do this, it occurred to me that you know, signs, signs are powerful indicators of meaning. They mark meaning in place. And signs purport to tell the truth. So we have a tendency to believe signs. And so as you're thinking about signs and the way that we mark our landscape, I want you to think about that question. And I want to open then with this, with this uh, sign, which is right here on the grounds of the University of Virginia. Matthew, would you read this for us? Sure. These garden walls, originally designed and built by Thomas Jefferson as a part of his architectural plan for the University of Virginia, were restored and the enclosed gardens planted by the Garden Club of Virginia in 1952. The garden designs were by Alden Hopkins, landscape architect. So it's important for us to ask, what is the truth that this sign wants us to believe? We're going to revisit that after some time. So Thomas Jefferson imagined the University of Virginia as a fundamental, as a foundation for an emergent democracy. For Jefferson and for many of the other founding fathers, a democracy was insupportable without an, an educated populace. So these two things, an emergent democracy and a robust public education were inextricably linked. He even said early in his uh, career, as early as the 1770s, in a bill that he titled The Bill for the More Dif General Diffusion of Knowledge, he says that the best defense against the corruption of government is to illuminate the minds of the people at large. So public education and a sustainable, healthy, robust democracy are inextricably linked. He built a tiered system of public education, a radical idea in the 1770s when he wrote it, that would go all the way from elementary up through the University of Virginia, or through, through university education at that point. So the University of Virginia then was understood in Jefferson's mind to be the capstone project of his life, the capstone experience for a, a structure that was designed and intended to buttress democracy. It's, it's all about democracy. And so that's what the academical village was in his imagination. This is a lithograph print that uh, comes out actually before the academical village even comes to completion. 
the, this landscape doesn't even exist yet as it's represented uh, in this view, although it's really close. And it represents the academical village from a particular perspective. And that perspective is um, uh, essentially where the Homer statue is today. Looking up the lawn, you can see the 10 pavilions, five on each side, the rotunda at the end, and the ranges of student rooms uh, between. So this is the landscape that Jefferson wants us to understand to be the truth of the academical village. There are 10 pavilions because they were intended to be 10 professors. There's a direct correlation between the, the foundational um, uh, dissemination of knowledge via the person of the professor and, of course, the Temple of Knowledge, the repository of all books in the library, and each of the 10 uh, pavilions. This then would collectively become his academical village. And as architectural historians, and as historians writ large, we tend to talk about the academical village through these particular buildings. The 10 pavilions, because they have such an articulate designer, have seized the imagination of most historians when we write about the academical village. And we talk about these buildings, these 10 buildings, as, in Jefferson's words, the chaste and refined architecture that would elevate the mind of the student. It was important that these buildings um, reveal the ennobling arts of the ancient classical models, because in that way, he's in direct conversation with James Madison, who turned to ancient classical models for the writing of our own constitution. The turning to antique exemplars is exactly what one does when one is imagining a future democracy. Madison does this, and he turns to, and does the, Jefferson does this in his own academical village. And so there are, one, I, I, could, I could spend the next hour, I wouldn't, but I could spend the next hour telling you all of the various quotations from ancient classical buildings that Jefferson is using in the, in, in the inscription and the redesign, the reimagination of this, uh, of this academical village. Um, but what that telling and what Jefferson's design hides is the presence that this, is the, is the uh, reality that this academical village was comprised of a 50% enslaved African American population. And so one way of looking at the academical village is from that particular perspective. And when you stand where the, where the Homer statue is and you look towards the 10 pavilions and you see the rotunda at the end, you're seeing the landscape as Jefferson intended it. That particular lithographic perspective is by intention. But it's also selective. He's choosing to represent for you the white landscape of knowledge. And there's an alternative landscape that's just as real that he elides in the selection of that particular frame. So his telling through the image, his telling of the academical village, is one that privileges white space, the white landscape of the academical village. So we have to have other ways of seeing. And we have to do the hard work as historians and as citizens to undertake the hard work of seeing anew spaces we think we know. And so rather than this lithographic perspective, which shows a particular viewpoint and privileges a certain set of people in this landscape, one way we can do this is to overlay the current the census records from the 1830s onto a map of the academical village. And that's what this image represents. From the 1830, so we have the University of Virginia has decennial census, which means that someone comes through from the federal government and, and takes an accounting of everybody who's in each of the particular buildings. That census taking includes both white and enslaved people, white and black people. Uh, the small number of free, uh, free African Americans that are also part of this landscape records age and gender. So we have a really pretty good snapshot in once every 10 years, 1830, 1840, 1850, and 1860, of who's actually here. And this representation tells us quite well, right? So we look at this particular, well, that's not a good example. Look at this particular pavilion. So this is pavilion one. There are four white residents captured in that census. That building houses five enslaved black people. We look at this one. 
5 to 18. I'm probably, I'm probably actually going to delete this one. 12 yeah, to 28. So as soon as you put the census records on as a layer of data, all of a sudden this perspective begins to have some real problems, right? Because we're directly correlating here the pavilion with the white occupant in our imagination. In our ways of seeing, we're seeing only the white occupants of these buildings. But as soon as we start putting hard data onto this landscape, an entirely different way of seeing comes to light. We begin to see this landscape through a very, very different set of lenses. And so one of the other things that we've done over the last 10 years, well, sorry, last five years, is we've been very slowly and carefully building a, a, three, a 3D digital model of the academical village in 1850. And this cross-section, which I'm about to talk about, is taken directly from that 3D model. Now, what's really impressive about this 3D model is that it is actually layered onto a rectified terrain. So we have recaptured the original topography of the academical village in 1850, and we have rebuilt all of the pavilions, uh, and in two of the yards, all of the buildings in the rear yards, as well as all of the ranges, accurate to the inch. Right? So this digital model is accurate to the inch, which is, I have to say, an impressive feat. So on the digital side, there's a whole different lecture. It's awesome. But it's also so huge, it has so much data, I can't actually manipulate it on the screen. Right? You have to have a super, super computer uh, to actually manipulate all the data that's part of this digital model. So what I've cut for you is, 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 a, is a still. So we know that these pavilions were designed to function in a certain way. Right? Jefferson's quite clear about this. Uh, the upper floor of a pavilion is the residence for who? Students. No. The professor. The professor right? The upper floor of the pavilion is their residence. The lower floor of the pavilion is intended to then be what space? The classroom space, right? And so there is actually a walkway that connects this upper story of this pavilion to this upper story of this pavilion to that one. Jefferson actually refers to this as his streets. There's the West Street and the East Street. And those streets connect pavilion to pavilion. And in that way, they actually connect one story apartment to the next one story apartment, providing a landscape of sociability amongst all of the professors which actually physically separates them from the landscape of sociability of the students below. So even in the design of his pavilions, he's already engaged in social engineering. He's using the landscape as a way of segregating groups of people. We often talk about these pavilions as two stories, <coughs> but we're wrong. This cross section makes quite clear that this pavilion, which is Pavilion 7 uh, of the Academical Village, is a three-story building. And some of them actually have functional attics, they're four stories. So if this is the professor's residence, and this is the classroom space, which is the nexus between the students coming horizontally and the professor coming down, it's that meeting zone, right? This, of course, is the space for those 18 people, or 12 people, that are caught in the census. We have to begin to populate the majority of the human beings that are in this building, are in this basement, they're associated with this cellar space. But look also how Jefferson manipulates the landscape. He's really quite efficient at this. The, the pavilions look like two-story buildings because they're standing on the edges of a ridge. Right? He picks out a ridge to build the academical village. The topography drops off. It descends on both sides of the academical village. He exploits that change in topography purposefully so that these are three-story buildings on the backside if they're only two-story buildings on the front, right? They sit at that change in topography, which means that these two floors, which are primarily intended to be occupied by white people, right, they face the lawn. This floor, which is occupied by the majority population, the enslaved African Americans, it faces the rear. And so what he is actually doing is he's stacking, he's like pancakes, uh, the floors, but they're, they're racially segregated already just in the design they face different directions because they're oriented to different landscapes. And in that, just as Jefferson is segregating between professors and students, he's also segregating between whites and blacks. He's, an, he's a genius designer, right? This is a, well, there we go, boom. <laughs> he's not done this, he's done this before, right? So when you look at Monticello, that's exactly what you get. This is the view that, Monticello, that the Jefferson family would want us to have 
right, of his landscape. We've just had dinner. We've walked out through the portico into the rear garden, and we're enjoying drinks on the lawn. That's the sort of sociability space of whiteness at Monticello. But when we, and Monticello's done this great, the great work with these uh, digital models as well. When, uh, when we use digital media for alternative means of seeing, we can actually begin to see that this is actually, it's a, it's a wholly different set of landscapes, right? And so this landscape up here, again, is the landscape of white sociability. Jefferson builds Monticello on a, on a ridge top, flattens the landscape on top of it, right? And uses the change in topography as a way of hiding laboring black bodies, right? He's manipulating the landscape and the organization of spaces in that landscape so that whites see whites, and that whites are not seeing the laboring black body. Implicit in that, and particularly true for the University of Virginia, but it's also true at Monticello, which he knows is a major tourist site, even in his own age. Implicit in that is his own known anxieties around slavery, right? Jefferson fully recognizes that Virginia is utterly dependent on the institution of slavery, but he's also really quite willing, at least when, when a French audience is his readership, as it is in the notes on the state of Virginia, he's really quite willing to be truthful about the fact that the institution of slavery introduces moral rot into, anyone, into any community. And so at the University of Virginia, what he's doing is he's trying to protect the integrity of, of uh, education by removing it from not just the laboring black body, but the institution of slavery itself, which he understands is morally fa fallible ground. And so we have to have alternative ways of seeing, like this plan. But even here, when we look at this particular representation of the academical village, right, the five pavilions on each side, the rotundas at the top, this is the range, the chapel, just for orientation, is up here. It doesn't exist here. There's all of these open spaces, these gardens, with these curvilinear garden walls, these famous curvilinear garden walls, right? Those are those open spaces. In this map representation, cartographic representation of the academical village, those spaces are empty, right? Those are empty spaces. But of course, as we'll find out in a few minutes, um, they're not empty. The Garden Club of Virginia in 1948 did the great work of giving us colonial revival gardens. And so everything that we experience in those garden landscapes today, they're all a product of the 1948 imagination. What would a colonial garden look like? And, and now, because they've been there, they were installed in 1948, they're actually a historic landscape unto themselves, right? They're more than 50 years old, right? They're worthy of, of protection. But what do they do? They mask a whole other landscape that preexisted those gardens. So the installation of those gardens in 1948 is a reimagining, it's a re-signing of those spaces. We'll get back to that in a few minutes. With the pavilions, we have the incredible resource of these 10 original drawings. Jefferson produces a, a construction drawing, design drawing, for each of the 10 pavilions, and they all survive in their special collections. And I've put them all on the screen here, um, a, a variable according to size. And you can see that this is pavilion 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10, 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9. These are organized on the screen as they would be on the academical village, right? And that's how we've often thought about these, is actually in their spatial correlation as they uh, were re realized in the final product. But one of the things that I've been able to do over the last few years is actually not put them in numeric order, but put them in chronological order. What does a study of Jefferson's pavilions organized chronologically tell us about Jefferson's own design process? Right? So I'm just going to give you a few little glimpses of this. This, of course, is Pavilion 7, which is the first of the pavilions built. It's the one that has the arches. Right? He changes his mind after he gets the, the pavilion. The arches are up. He's like, yeah, I don't like that. We're doing columns for everything else. Uh, but he's too cheap to tear it down, which is actually a good thing. So this is the pavilion. This, of course, is the residence. That's the classroom space. This is the upper floor residence. You can see on the ground floor, 
You have a door that goes directly into one large classroom. You have a door that goes into a side hallway, and that side hallway gives you access directly up into the uh, professor's accommodations, right? So two doors lead to the two floors. You, of course, don't have any direct access into the cellar space because it's subterranean. Um, but, so you have to take that staircase down. I want you to just use your historical imagination for a second and walk through this cellar space with me. I've come down the stairs. I'm in a long horizontal kitchen space. We know that that's the intended cooking fireplace for the kitchen, right? The long horizontal space. There are two doors into other chambers. Those chambers are a little too big to be pantries and a little too small to be sleeping quarters, but, so we don't really have a sense for what those are. But imagine yourself, the building is now complete, and you're the probably female cook having to produce a meal in that kitchen. Why is that challenging? Sure, absolutely, but that's true in, in lots of other houses, right? Why is it particularly challenging in this design? You have to go outside to go inside? You don't. There's a staircase right there. They'll take you right up to the... There's old... no ventilation. Yeah. Or light. Look at or this. Light. Hey, wait, wait. Now you're on it. The only cir air circulation and the only exterior light is through this one exterior door when it stands open, right? So Jefferson knows it's got to have a kitchen. But he's so con concerned with the spaces upstairs that he just pays no attention whatsoever to the functionality of the kitchen as he designs it in the cellar, right? So it's an utterly wretched place to work, <laughs> right? Um, and we also know that these spaces flood. We have regular uh, complaints from the later occupants of these, of these pavilions that their enslaved population is constantly sick because they're sleeping on the damp brick floors of our cellars and they have to constantly pump water out, right? So these are pretty miserable spaces. So we then turn to the second set of spaces that Jefferson designs, right? This is Pavilion 3, which would be the second design he does. Um, and you can see, uh, so here's the, still the direct entrance into the classroom, the side hallway, so that arrangement sur uh, survives to the rear passage. There's a rear chamber on the main floor that uh, gives access up to the upper floor. And so there's the second story, which is the apartment for the professor. But you look at the cellar. Now you descend and you still have that horizontal kitchen on the back. But you can see that he's re relocated the fireplace onto the interior wall so that he can now have a, do a rear door. And there's one, two, three windows, right? And so his second attempt at designing a pavilion with a kitchen is far more successful. Why? You know, because somebody's bitching, right? Like, it is a bear to cook a meal in this kitchen. Don't you do that to the next house, right? And so he actually does have, there must, oh, we have no record of that. I'm totally making that up. But there must be some feedback mechanism of failure in this instance, because this is a significantly more successful space. But what's interesting is then this doorway gives access to this enormous room with this one tiny little, and it's actually a half window, it's not even a full window, right? So there is this deep, huge room that would later be called the servant's hall. And that's an important phrase in two ways. One, hall, what does hall mean? I say hall, you think hallway, right? What they would refer to in the 18th and the 19th century, that's a passage. A hall is like, you have to imagine Harry Potter Great Hall, right? Hall means, in the early modern sense, the big social space the space where everything happens. And so if you have 12 or 18 enslaved people that are owned and are functioning in this particular household, they're all sleeping there, right? This is the collective space. You might have a few privileged and safe people who are sleeping in the hallways upstairs or sleeping on mats in the attic, but this is the collective sleeping space for that entire enslaved population. And then of course, we also have to recognize that they're not using the word slave. It's called a servant's hall, right? Once again, ignoring the actual legal institution that's at play. Um, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I could go on for, for a few more of these, but his designs continue to improve over time. And by the time you get to the, uh, the east side of the lawn, that's the sequence on the west. By the time you get to the east side of the lawn, we take a look at this cellar design. You have one large open cooking space 
that is now south facing. The other two were west facing. Why would you want a south facing window, a uh, south facing kitchen? For the window light, right? And so he's continuing to struggle with the, finally, with the design of the cellar to allow the best light. So in his second iteration, he's simply allowing some light, but it's still not south facing. Now he's still continuing to get enough complaints, I posit, um, that he's finally making a south facing kitchen with lots of light and a large open cooking fireplace. Here are those two small, now, now these fully subterranean chambers actually become pantries. And so these are probably lockable chambers for the storage of fine goods and cook, cook stuff. And what's also important about this, by the time you get to the far side, the second half of the pavilions he's designing, he's built into this a private chamber. A private chamber with its own window and a door that goes directly into the kitchen. Whose chamber is that? The cook, that's exactly right. So by the time he gets to the end of his period of design for the pavilions, he's actually incorporating not just a common space, he's now finally recognizing the social structure and the political structure of the enslaved labor force. What that means is, and what we know through other historical modes, the cook is the most important and the most uh, powerful enslaved person in any antebellum household, right? Because she, commonly, sometimes he, she is in charge of delivering a series of complicated meals at a certain set of times. She has a very specific regimen that she must meet. And that means managing dairy. And that means managing firewood. And that means managing uh, the production of meats, um, the uh, growing of vegetables, right? There's a whole system, a whole landscape of functionality that all has to converge in a meal that doesn't get burned and delivered at the table hot. That's a lot of work in the 19th century. That's a lot of work today. Like think about the stress of mom at the Thanksgiving dinner, right? It's pretty stressful. Like that every day with no gas, right? So this is a big deal. So the, the cook actually has this privileged position and the architecture of the pavilion, by the time he gets to the end of this process, actually recognizes the social and political structure of the landscape of an antebellum household, right? And so by looking at these pavilions, you can actually begin to see change over time. So that's one telling of slavery, and that's really around Jefferson's blindnesses. Can we use design and the history of the design of the pavilion landscape to expose Jefferson's own blindnesses about what he does care about and what he does see and what he doesn't see? This is an alternative telling, and I'm actually going to read this. Zachariah was exhausted. He was strong, but the task was daunting. His owner, Luther M. George, recently leased him to the university, which had been under construction for two years. Soon after Zachariah arrived on site, Mr. Henderson, the overseer for construction, directed him to dig the cellar and foundation for a new hotel, and this would be Hotel A, which stood behind and downhill from the first of the pavilions. Having lived and labored in Albemarle County most of his life, Zachariah had seen the firing of the massive kiln that produced the bricks for the first of the academical pavilions. As he dug, he watched other black men working daily to level the land of the larger worksite. The previous summer, they had removed huge volumes of earth. Records would report in one summer 1,000 cubic yards with shovels, forming what Mr. Henderson called terraces. Zachariah watched as these men deployed shovels and barrows to transform slowly the gentle hillocks into the staged building sites for three new pavilions. Soon thereafter, those same men dug foundations and cellars for the next two pavilions. He learned that there were to be ten, five on each side. Since only one building now stood complete, Zachariah and his fellow laborers slept on floor pallets in the upstairs chambers while the cook struggled to produce meals in the nearly unlit cellar kitchen. Zachariah's daily work excavating the cellar hotel moved quickly until he hit bedrock. For weeks, he shoveled the loose earth, all the while knowing 
the substantial bedrock also had yet to be extracted. Once Zachariah began chipping away at the stone, his pace dramatically slowed, and Henderson became frustrated. Soon, the earth-moving team from the pavilions was reassigned to work with Zachariah, and with the assistance of these others, the excavation was eventually completed. The deep cellar of Hotel A and its attendant sunken yard, which you can see here in the digital model, this is Hotel A, that's the sunken yard. The deep, the deep cellar of Hotel A and its attendant sunken yard are the work of Zachariah's hands. Yet while he was digging, Jefferson and the board of directors were debating the appropriate size for a hotel. The sunken workyard Zachariah toiled so hard to excavate in 1821 was likely the result of a decision to shrink the building plan for the hotel after the cellar had already been excavated. And if that was not frustrating enough, the majority of Zachariah's earned money, more than $25, would go to his owner. My first telling privileges the maker, the designer. I should say the designer, not the maker. Privileges the designer. And that's certainly an appropriate way to tell the history of a built environment. But an alternative way is to think through the laborer. Because Zachariah's story matters. His dignity has been long suppressed. How can we as historians do the hard work of seeing Zachariah, who has never been seen? The historical record is the process of redignifying. We have done that for Jefferson plenty of times, too much. We have yet to do that for so many other people who lived and labored in this landscape. And so as architectural historians, and as historians, and as citizens, we bear the responsibility of taking that act of making dignity, of bestowing dignity, on people unseen. This is one experiment in the telling of Zachariah's story. We only know about Zachariah because we have all the account books that register the frustrations of his toils, the frustrations of his overseer, the removal of laborers, and a final payment. Zachariah's story comes from four entries in the, in the count book, registering expenditures, and that's it. Right? And so we have to ask questions about how is it that in the use of signs, in the use of history, we can begin to make seen that which is unseen. So when we look at a pavilion, we often see just those two floors. We see those two floors because those are the floors that we're intended to see. right? Architecture and landscape gears us to see in a certain way. Slavery is not only implicated in the making of the academical village, and I have to say I chuckled a few years ago when Michelle Obama claimed that the White House was built uh, by enslaved people and people objected. <laughs> so we're like, well, what are you thinking? <laughs> right? It's in the American South. Every building in the American South is produced by the hands of enslaved laborers. That's just the uniform, truthful condition of the American landscape before the American Civil War, right? And so when we think about these spaces, we start to think about the gardens that were there, we have to recognize that there's whole numbers of these other buildings that are now lost. And so this is on an Albemarle, farm, an Albemarle plantation, a smokehouse of exactly the same uh, period as the academical village. That whole landscape of construction is lost. Over the last five years, I've been, well, six years really, I've been doing some investigative work in the marginalized spaces of the academical village, looking for evidence of slavery. I'm gonna show you just a few quick examples. On the staircase, as one ascends into the attic of Pavilion One, right on the right side, if the light catches just, just right, and I've used some very tricky light work to get this photograph, can you read what this says? This is early 19th century script. We know that the staircase is installed in 1826. That's an H. Hurrah. 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 Hurrah for Moses. Dang. Right? Another little window, a chink in the armor of blindness. 
opens through, a little light comes through, hurrah for Moses. So yeah, we've gone to the databases, we've gone to the records, who was Moses, right? Can we begin to reconstruct Moses' story? It turns out that there are four or five different Moseses that are at work in the academical village in the 1830s. One turns out to have been a carpenter. We'll never know if that's the Moses that's being referred to here. It seems actually a little unlikely, it would be a little too coincidental. Um, but it raises for us important questions about literacy. Um, there is an incredibly important uh, stonemason who is purchased from Monticello and moved down here to the academical village. The rotunda, of course, burns in the 1890s. And with that burning is the remaking of all of the terraces around that, which means that all of the marble steps that you ascend when you go to the rotunda today are all installed in 1896 to 1898. Well, we have an early account that indicates, I think his name is Greenhill. A mason by the name of Greenhill comes down from Monticello and actually carves all of the stone steps of Monticello. We did a little work. Those steps survive. Does anybody know where this is? You drive past this every day. <laughs> So this is, right behind me is the fraternity that's in the shape oh, of Monticello. Yeah, yeah. And this is that parking lot. Right. That's that other fraternity, the A yeah. school. The building we're in is right up here, right? That's not Culberth, but it's the, what's the name of the drive? Uh, Bailey. The Bailey, Bailey, yeah, Bailey Drive. This is on the right-hand side of Bailey Drive. So we have these artifacts carved by, by a known enslaved uh, artisan, now just kind of discarded elsewhere on the grounds of the University of Virginia. In fact, we might be able to, like right around the corner over there, Can right? I tell that was discovered? Um, because Buildings and Grounds has unbelievably accurate records from through the whole 20th century. And so we know that he carved the stone steps, but uh, it's the 1904 accounting of the remaking of the terraces that indicates, oh yeah, we just moved those over to Bailey. Yeah, we just stuck them up by, by Bailey. Um, so what does it mean to be a named artisan? Right? One of the things we have to recognize is that in the Constitution of Slavery, Self-emancipation is always a drive, right? What does it mean to be famous, right? You've worked really hard, you've built up a reputation, you now have a name for yourself, people know you. That means self-emancipation becomes significantly more difficult, right? And so there's, so uh, there has, we have to ask questions also about the raising up of these kinds of challenges. How do you navigate as an enslaved person? How do you navigate this landscape of construction or landscape of operation? And so one of the things we're also doing is working through these gardens. Those garden landscapes were filled not with gardens initially, but these were all workspaces. This is where chickens are being plucked. This is where hogs are being gutted and um, uh, uh, seasoned and dried, salted. This is where uh, eggs are being collected, cows are being milked. Uh, th these are the workspaces. All of those spaces are the workspaces of the academical village. This is McGuffey Cottage. This is the sole surviving example of one of the many, many uh, accommodations that were built between the 30s and the 50s, 1830s to the 50s, to house this large population of enslaved people. Um, we, it, we discovered in one of these attics this row of nails. These nails do nothing. They don't hold anything together. And so we've actually posited that we think that one of the, uh, one of the cooks in Pavilion 2 has probably put these nails up here as a way of drying herbs for uh, pres you know, allowing her, herself to season um, uh, season her food through the, through the winter. This is another uh, capture from that digital model. You get a better sense here of the complexity of the digital model. And what it allows us to do is to begin to reconstruct these rear yards filled with all kinds of spaces, right? It's a really, really important tool for re-seeing to be able to wipe away a space that was put in in the 1940s and the 1950s and to re-see the actual historical accuracy of that moment. I'm going to end by telling the story of Lucy Cottrell. This is a photograph of Lucy Cottrell, and here, this is, uh, this is a little bit late in life, this is a post-war uh, post photograph uh, showing her um, uh, in a, as a, as a, a nurse. A, a nurse. Uh, but we know that Lucy Cottrell was purchased uh, from the estate at Monticello and was uh, fairly quickly moved down to the University of Virginia where she was purchased by George Bladerman, the professor in what is now Pavilion 4. Uh, this series of uh, chambers, of windows on the ground floor of uh, Pavilion 4, 
uh, were all spaces that let light into uh, her chambers. So to kind of come full circle, this is the floor plan for Pavilion 4 in the cellar. You can see the long longitudinal kitchen, these two fully subterranean pantries. There's that circulation space. And then what's that chamber? The cook's chamber, right? So this is the, left, the one leftover space that has illumination and a separate door. This is the cook's chamber. So those two windows illuminate Lucy Cottrell's chamber, right? And so now we begin to say, oh, wait a second. We can actually put a person. That's her residence. And we know that she's purchased and moved down here with two, her two adolescent boys and her ailing mother. And so it's not just her personal chamber, but it's her family's, it's her family space. And she's, uh, she's living right there. And that didn't move. And so that then means that we need to start reimagining how did this space actually function, right? So this is a cellar space, but it's contingent with the work yard. We know that all of, this, all of that activity is happening. And as we're, the B is her chamber. Lucy Cottrell, to get out and into this work yard, has to leave her kitchen, go through that walkway, into the rear yard, through that gate, and into actually the, the work yard itself where most of the livestock are being kept. That's an incredibly inefficient circuit, right? When we started to uh, really analyze the cellar space, we looked, there's a very heavily worn space on the original brick floor right here. And we went into this subterranean space here, and we actually found that there was a door broken through that had been re-bricked up. And so when originally constructed, this was a solid wall. Soon after occupation, a door gets blown through and then sometime soon after the Civil War, that opening gets re-bricked up. Why would there need to be a door there, right? What Lucy Cottrell has done is she's asked for a much more direct circuit to her work yard. So she is remaking a space that Jefferson designed. She's the next architect of that space, imposing her will on the fluidity of that space to better serve her purposes, right? Now, that's probably only going to save her half an hour or 45 minutes a day. Why would she care about that? Because she has two adolescent sons. To be able to save an extra half hour a day is an extra half hour that she might be able to spend being a mom. And so the final act that we have to do is we've got to remember the humanity of the people we're talking about. Yes, they're human figures. Yes, they're historical agents, they're actors. But they were also people with dignity and families. And so to reimagine the making of this space and then the remaking of this space to better accommodate her dignity and her deep desire to parent her children well, means that that door becomes incredibly important, right? It's part of the remaking of her particular story. And so in conclusion, when we look at this kind of sign, it's critical that we read, read signs with a degree of historical literacy and a degree of historical criticism. These garden walls, well, hold on there. There are gardens in 1948. They ain't gardens. They're dirt work yards with the blood of pigs and chicken feathers and slop, right? That's what these spaces are. Those walls, all of those walls, every single curvilinear wall at the Academical Village, they're all built in 1948. Not one of those is from Jefferson's era. Now, they were there, but they were all gone. The Garden Club reconstructed them. And so the walls themselves are actually from 1948. And in reconstruction, they were rebuilt at five feet. We know from historical records, they were eight feet tall. What's the experiential difference between eight feet and five feet? Yeah. At five feet, there are beautiful little dividers between colonial gardens. They function as a way of segregating beauty. But at eight feet, they're very, very clearly differentiating between races. This is a landscape of segregation by design. 
And so this sign lies to us. This sign tells a lie. These are not garden walls. They may have been designed, but they sure as hell were not built by Jefferson. Right? And so as citizens, we have to be, we have to speak the truth. We have a moral, ethical responsibility to be truth tellers. And when we see false claims on signs, it's our responsibility as citizens to contest that and to speak truth back to power. Thank you. Any questions? So in 1948 and 1952, there were people that knew those weren't gardens. Yeah. So where were they? Where were their voices? Um, not just not included. Matter. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was just easier. I mean, in the 19, yeah, in the 1940s, the, the, yeah, the, the power of the colonial revival, particularly in those years, immediately after the sort of devastation of the of World War II, right? I mean, this is this is an era. The late 40s are an era in which America is really in shock, right? And so we want easy stuff. Right? We're still denying the Holocaust. We're not really talking about it pu you know, publicly. This is an era in which the saw easy history. Like we want to click on the, the television, right? It doesn't exist yet. But we want to click on a television and just watch a stupid movie in the 19, late 1940s. That's what this is. Right? It's an ease for our conscience. So from Emancipation to 1948, what did those spaces look like? Yeah, 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 okay. So, um, by the 1920s, the walls had completely come, in, come down from neglect, and all of those spaces were fully overgrown. What has happened? What's been invented by the 1920s that means those garden spaces are no longer useful? Refrigeration, right? So the rise of the modern kitchen by the 1920s means you don't need those spaces anymore. All of those exterior spaces, well, you've got the rise of the... Um, Food supermarket, mm -hmm. the food market, with prepared food, sealed food, by and yeah, by canned, and you have uh, refrigeration. So all of that infrastructure is just no longer needed, and that's why the garden club just moves in really easily, really quickly, and is able to do this because they're just kind of marginal leftover spaces at this point. Nobody cares about them. Well, I will say, as a plug for our next exhibition at the Freeland Museum of Art, um, George O'Keefe, when George O'Keefe was here in 1912 and 1916, these are Italianate gardens. Yeah. Terraced Italian, yeah. they're super picturesque. Yeah. She's doing these watercolor sketches, and there are mm. capitals from the, the original capitals from the rotunda in the center Arnold, of the garden, yeah. and it's like this, it's this total Roman fantasy. Yeah. So when does that go away? That must be largely neglected by the 30s. By the 30s? Yeah, I think yeah. that's because the photographs that I've seen just prior to the construction is they're just overgrown. Right. They're just not beautiful at all. Right. It, but it, it's also possible that most of the photographs, it may be that one side is different from the other. Well, right. And so right? She's on the, these are mostly from the east. And the and the photographs I'm thinking of are on the west side, right. actually. So that may be the difference. Yeah.